I want you to imagine that you have the graph of y equals x squared on a piece of paper in front of you. Except instead of the entire graph, you only have the segment where x is between 0 and 1. Now imagine what you would see if you were to lift up this piece of paper and hold it in front of your face. And then what would happen if just the graph were to hop off the page and start spinning around the x-axis? To get a better idea of what's going on, let's follow a point on its journey around the x-axis. It makes a circle. And this makes sense because the graph is spinning in a circle around the x-axis. And if we follow another point, it would make a circle as well, although perhaps a different size. Can you visualize what happens if we trace out the path of the entire graph as it spins? I'll let you take a look. Now let's get at the real question. If we cut this graph off when x equals 1 and spin it around the x-axis, it outlines a solid shape. What is the volume of this shape? Meaning if we filled this in, what would its volume be? Before we answer that, let's formulate an easier question. If we spin a thin bar around the x-axis at the same time that we spin the graph, what shape does that make? And what's the volume of that shape? We see a disc, which looks exactly like a hockey puck since I drew it in black. So how is this related to the entire volume? Well, if we had a bunch of different sized discs or hockey pucks, we would be able to stack them inside our shape to approximate the volume. And you might realize if we had extremely thin disks, then we would be missing less volume as we stacked them up. Well, that's exactly the right idea. The thinner the disks get, the better they approximate the actual volume of this solid. Let's get into the math behind the idea. We will first find the volume of a single disk. But remember, the disks get crazy thin. So let's call the height dx because it's located along the x-axis and to indicate how incredibly small it will become. The radius of this disk is simply y, the vertical distance from the x-axis to the graph, but y is equal to x squared, so an equivalent way to write the radius is just x squared. This is ideal because now our variables are all both in terms of x. In case you don't remember, the volume of a disk is pi r squared h. Substituting x squared for the radius and dx for the height, we get an expression for volume of our disk in terms of x only. This is quite powerful. Once you write the volume of one disk in complete generality, meaning only using variables, then you're able to write down a formula for the volumes of all those insanely thin disks with virtually no extra work. Remember, sigma means to add up all of these volumes. And as we fit more and more disks into this solid shape, meaning the number of disks goes to infinity, you see that they must get thinner and thinner. And finally, this gives us the total volume that we're searching for. Hopefully you immediately recognize this as being equivalent to an integral. So we ditch the sigma for the integral sign, keeping our formula for volume underneath, and indicate where we start and stop adding up the volumes of the disks. As practice, evaluate the integral. You'll get pi over 5 cubic units, which is the exact volume of our solid. How incredible is it that we did all that just from a little segment of a graph? But there's more. What if we had spun the graph around the y-axis instead of the x-axis? There was nothing special about the x-axis, so we should be able to run a similar program. Following individual points, we see that everything just spins in a circle. Of course, different points may give different sized circles, just as before. Let's see if you can visualize what happens as we trace out the path of the entire graph as it spins. Similar to before, let's cut off this graph when y is equal to 1 and spin it around the y-axis so that it outlines a solid shape. What's the volume of this shape? I hope you have a good idea of where this is going now. To find the actual volume, we will fill up this solid with thinner and thinner disks. Start off easy by first looking for the volume of a single disk. This time, we must call the height of the disk dy because it's located along the y-axis, and of course to indicate how incredibly small it will become. The radius of the disk is x, the horizontal distance from the y-axis to the graph. But in order to get our variables to match, let's get the radius in terms of y. Again, the volume of a disk is pi r squared h. 
once we substitute our variables, boom, we have the volume of a disk in terms of y. To get an expression for the volume of the entire shape, we add up the volumes of all the disks and let the number of disks go to infinity. This is exactly what the integral is. So we ditch the limit and the sigma for the sleek integral sign, leaving our volume formula under the integral and indicating where we are starting and stopping. Just be careful on this last part because it's in terms of y, although it happens to be from 0 to 1 again. As practice, evaluate this integral to get the exact volume of the solid shape. In our last example, let's get a little crazy. Let's take this region between the graph of y equals x squared and the line y equals 1, as shown in the picture, and rotate it around the dotted line y equals 2. If you take a single point, you can see that it spins in a circle. But can you see what will happen when you spin this entire solid region around the dotted line? Try to find the volume of this solid.